Welcome, everybody, to another recording of Mondays with Mundy. And that's me, Jim Mundy, the historian of the Union League Legacy Foundation at the Union League of Philadelphia on beautiful South Broad Street and beautiful Center City, Philadelphia. All right. If you're watching today's program on Monday, May the 11th, you're actually watching it on the 155th anniversary of the opening of what we call the Broad Street Building, that beautiful brick and brownstone building that has become the iconic symbol of the Union League ever since uh, it was it opened in 1865. So, so today we're going to talk about the buildings of the League. All right, so uh, I'm gonna use a PowerPoint and we're gonna see if we can teach an old dog new tricks, or at least a new trick because I'm an older dog than you think I am. So here we go. All right, okay, looks like it. We hit this and we go over here and we go to, all right. Okay, we hit slideshow, we hit from the beginning. Voila, it worked. My gosh, maybe you can teach an old dog a new trick. Hot dog, all right, let's see what happens then, okay. All right, off we go. Uh, this, the building you see in front of you on the screen is actually the very first clubhouse of the Union League, but it was at 1118 Chestnut Street. It was called the Hartman Coon Mansion. Uh, you can see typical Philadelphia federal style mansion, brick, brick and more brick, because that's what Philadelphia did. Uh, and um, the league occupied it beginning February the 23rd of 1863, and it would stay there until August, roughly the 11th, I believe it was, of 1864. Okay, But it was pretty evident from the very beginning that uh, the building would never suit the needs of the league itself, because by the end of 1863 alone, there were a thousand members in the, in the club. So they needed something bigger. And what they decided to do was build their own clubhouse. And so in early 1864, all right, uh, a number of members with the board's approval purchased the property at 140 South Broad Street, as we think of it today, okay, the, the southwest corner of Broad and Sanson Streets. And there you're looking at it right now. So the building on the left hand side was on the lot at the time. Uh, it was a cast iron and stove manufacturer and retail outlet. Mostly at the signs on it, you can see it was also the headquarters of the 183rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment, which was known as the 4th Union League Regiment. But by this point in time, the 4th Union League was already out of the city and onto the battlefield. So uh, the building was coming down, all right? The lot itself was 100 feet wide by 200 feet deep. And if you look, down Sansom Street, you will see the ubiquitous red brick Philadelphia Rojo. And that's what occupied the rest of the block on both Sansom on the north side, Moravian on the south side, and 15th Street on the west side. Okay, so that's what it looked like. And the building on the right hand side, a uh, piece of trivia, was the Academy of Natural Sciences before it moved to the parkway. Okay, all right. And this is what replaced that building. Isn't this spectacular? The architect was John Fraser, a Scottish immigrant architect to Philadelphia in the 19th century when Philadelphia seemed to specialize in Scottish immigrant architects. Unfortunately, there is no known photograph of Fraser. I mean, even the almighty Google hasn't, <laughs> hasn't produced one yet. So uh, I, I'm sorry about that. I would love to know what he looked like myself. Uh, this is considered the first building in the city in the Second Empire style. It was a new style coming out of France during the Second Empire of Napoleon III. He ruled 1850 to 1871, all right? It was a very nationalistic style, uh, but its distinctive feature was the mansard roof, that is, that kind of gently sloping roof from front to back, all right? And it generally involved a tower somewhere at the same time. Uh, this is uh, a very, sublime form of the Second Empire, if you will, because I think the City Hall, just two blocks north, which is considered the greatest Second Empire building in the country, and you can see how different the two buildings are. I mean, they don't architecturally or visually relate to each other, but nonetheless, they were designed only five years apart. So, so this is what the members walked into on May the 11th of 1865, just a spectacular, spectacular building. Brick and brownstone, as we know, uh, the slate mansard roof, granite foundation, uh, and it's uh, still with us today. All right, so let's let's go to the next slide and see what we see. All right, so the Daily Evening Bulletin and its issue of May 15th of 1865 published a front 
page article about the opening of the, Lug, of the new League House. It, I mean, at this point, uh, the war is over. Uh, the League is the most prominent, if not his important institution in the city of Philadelphia. And so, of course, the opening of its new clubhouse was going to be a major event. And it got the whole first page. Uh, and it is a wonderful article. We have many copies of it in the archives. Uh, I can also probably send a copy to anybody who wants one electronically. So just let me know. There's a lot of information on it. Actually, it is the best source of information we have because we don't have Fraser's floor plans. Even though you see in the article the first and second floor, and I'll show them to you here, all right? Uh, regretfully, we don't have the floor plans. I, be, before I go to the next slide, I want to point out, you can see that it's basically a rectangle with these four corners that kind of jut out, if you will, and they're called pavilions. So, so keep that in mind, okay? So that was the floor plan when the building opened in 1865. And why don't we have the floor plans of John Fraser? Because of this fire, September 7th of 1866. And you can see it destroyed the entire third floor of the clubhouse itself. Uh, that is where the league kept many of its paper documents, including we believe uh, its architectural records uh, because we don't have them. Nobody has them. They simply don't exist anywhere else. So we're very grateful for the fact that we have that article from May 15th of 1865. By the way, if you go to the third floor today, uh, you can see burnt timbers that are still there from the fire of 1866. Pretty neat. So let's move on. In the 19th century, right before we had computers and things like that, uh, and since you just saw a fire, insurance companies did a physical survey of the building that they were to insure. So they had the size, the shape, the dimensions of the property itself, its contents and things like that. Here we have an insurance survey from 1890 and it shows the first major addition to the back of the Broad Street building. And if you're seeing what I'm seeing, uh, <laughs> my window is blocking the, what is known as the annex in the upper right hand corner. I, there we go. Um, the annex was approximately 40 feet wide by 80 feet deep. It ran along the north side of the building, that is the Sansom Street side, and it was also in brick and brownstone and the Second Empire style. So it was, it was the same material. It looked the same, and that was important. You'll see a building off to the left, though, and that basically was a laundry that was located in one of the brick row homes on Moravian Street, and that's why it's on, so that the Ligon, so it was part of the survey itself. All right, so that was the first major addition, right? So the league goes from being roughly a building that was 100 feet square to now uh, being a building that's a little bit of an L shape, all right? So what happens next? All right, I must have figured this one out, okay. So here we have the same building survey, but they're showing the progression of the clubhouse itself. So behind the main annex, uh, which is, which again, 1881, uh, architect unknown, unfortunately, uh, in 1890, the club built something called what we think today of as the Benson Annex, and it's pretty much in the space where the Benson Room is today, on the first floor in the middle section. So, Benson Annex, because on the first floor of the annex itself, the 1881 annex, there was a billiard room, a pool room. Uh, but by the by 1890, it was the demand for pool was so great that they needed more pool tables, and they had no space to put them. So uh, league president Edwin North Benson donated a little over $10,000 to build a new annex that would include five new pool tables. Now, keep in mind, pool was serious stuff back then. I mean, they actually thought of it as physical exercise, the times being what they were, and hence the Benson Annex. So we go from a square, basically, to an L, now to this really odd-shaped U, isn't it? So, but you'll notice there's a, there's a spot on the right-hand side that's empty. And as we know, space of force of vacuum, so they will get filled in eventually. So let's see what's next. All right, uh, this is a photograph uh, from 1902, but it's the only one I could find that actually shows uh, what that 1881 annex looked like. So if you look on the right-hand side of the photograph, um, that's that telephone pole with all those branches, all right? Think of the email of the 19th century, and that was it. Uh, you can see how that, uh, that annex building rises up in the background, okay? But you can also see that, it, and just looking at the photographs, same material, same style. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an architectural set, if you will, right? And that's important because in the future, that won't always happen. All right, so let's move on to the next photograph. What we have, ah, another floor plan. All right, 
So here we are and we can, see, now this is 1897 as you can see. Um, we see the annex along the right hand side, all right? You see the billiard room as it was called on the first floor there. Benson Annex along top, another billiard room, and then on the left-hand side, something now called the New Cafe. That was a one-story uh, addition that filled in that empty space on the south side along Moravian Street, and it was basically a big giant dining room, right, called, and they called it the New Cafe because if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you see the Old Cafe, which is what we call today, but actually the Old Cafe was the cafe that was opened in 1886 by filling in some of the spaces between those corner pavilions. Uh, and we'll get to that one in a different segment of when we do league architecture. Just don't want to go too deep in the weeds right now. Just uh, try to give you some idea what how the building progressed over the over the years. So, uh, so here we are. It's the end of the 20th century, of the 19th century, and the league clubhouse is now roughly 200 feet deep down the block. And as you can see at the very top. Uh, it's, they're simply row homes going all the way down to 15th Street. And eventually the league would buy up all of those row homes and own the entire block because they knew even in the 1890s that they would expand down to 15th Street. Okay, so let's see how that happened. Look at that. All right, a photograph that shows the Moravian Street side of the clubhouse with that new cafe building along the left hand side of the image itself. So there you are. Okay, and again, brick and brownstone, uh, keeping in style with what was already there, so that again, uh, they maintained that set architectural piece, if you will. Now what? Oh, postcards, 19th century. Everybody was postcards. They're very, very popular. Uh, not that they're not today, but they were incredibly popular. What the league clubhouse looked like. So, and I would point out to the one in the lower right hand corner. And there's that annex of 1881 in the back. And you can see same height, same scale, same proportion. So it fit in. Okay, here we go. Now, the block itself is 300 feet long. The clubhouse is 200 feet deep. So there was another 100 feet to fill in. And uh, there was a competition uh, that was assigned in 1904. Uh, Things went wrong with it, and that's a different story as well, but we'll go into it in, in a future episode. So in 1908, uh, Horace Trumbauer, you see here, who was a league member, was awarded the commission for designing the fourth and last addition to the Union League Clubhouse. And it would fill in that 100 foot section from the end of the Benson Annex down to 15th Street itself. Now, Horace Trumbauer was a fascinating character, uh, born in the Bridesburg neighborhood of Philadelphia, you can see in 1868, German family, uh, never finished high school, went to work as an apprentice in an architectural firm, uh, George and William Hewitt, the brothers. And he was the last major architect in Philadelphia who really learned his trade through the apprentice system because Trumbauer never went back to school to study to be an architect. He simply learned it, he got OJT, right, on the job training. And he was so, uh, he did that when he was 15 years old. And when he turned 21, he opened up his own firm at Third and Chestnut Streets. And, he, and that was in 1890 and he never looked back. He would become one of the most successful architects, if not the most successful architect in Philadelphia until he died in 1938, okay? But a completely self-made man, all right? But uh, considered a great draftsman. And then in, the, in an architectural firm, a draftsman is the architect or the who literally makes the drawings, uh, you know, given the design that the architect had uh, decided on. And it's the, the draftsman's job to make the drawing that shows all the bits and pieces of it and how it all fits together, and whether it's the outside or the inside itself. And, and Trumbauer was considered an incredibly good and accomplished draftsman in his early years. So, so Horace Trumbauer has also joined the Union League in 1905, and he would stay a member until he died in 1938. Now, Horace Trumbauer couldn't do it all by himself. So obviously he had draftsmen in his office and things like that. So in 1902, this gentleman, Julian Abel, uh, graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Architecture. He was the first African-American to graduate from that school. Abel was from an old African-American family. Uh, 
uh, actually related to Absalom Jones, uh, going back into the 17th century, late 17th, early 18th centuries, um, very prominent family within the African American community. Abel was educated in all the ways that Horace Trumbaro is not. He graduated from the Institute of Colored Youth, which became Cheney University, went to the Philadelphia Museum School of Industrial Design, and then he went to the University of Pennsylvania after that for four years of architecture, so from which he graduated in 1902. For the next four years, he uh, traveled around both America and Western Europe, France specifically, to uh, do some more studying. Uh, and drawing and painting, he was an incredible watercolorist. And in 1906, he came back to Philadelphia when Stotesbury, I'm sorry, not Stotesbury, when Trumbauer hired him to be a draftsman, actually his chief draftsman. Uh, no, I take that back. 1906, he was the second draftsman in the house. Uh, Frank Seeberger was the, was the head draftsman. Seeberger would leave in 1909 to farm his own firm, and Trumbauer gave Abel the job of being the head draftsman, and it was a job that Abel kept until Trumbauer died in 1938, and that is one heck of a role and a position for Julian Abel. And Abel, Abel achieved great things in that firm, along with, with, with Trumbauer themselves. So, um, so when you think of the Union League clubhouse, uh, all right, here you see both sections uh, that were designed by the Trumbauer firm. Uh, you have to consider that you're looking at the work of the city's first African-American architect, as well as of Horace Trumbauer himself, right? One of the problems with the Trumbauer firm, uh, and which made it different from other firms, is that uh, the architects didn't sign their work, right? It was always, it always read from the office of, the, or the office of Horace Trumbauer. So uh, we will never really know which designs were Trumbauer's, which were Abel's, and things like that. But it's a sure bet that it was an incredibly, um, I mean, their partnership and their collaborative relationship was remarkable. And so this is the work of both Horace Trumbauer, Pablo, and then Julian Abel, in all likelihood. Okay. So if you look at the photograph, the far left side um, was the 15th Street section. And that is the section that opened at the end of 1910. All right. Uh, you can see the style change, the building materials change. It's now the Beaux Arts style, uh, which again came out of France. Only uh, actually beginning in the around 1830 at L'Ecole des Beaux Arts, the, the world's first accredited school of architecture. Uh, but as a, as a style in Philadelphia, it really didn't come into vogue until the 1880s, more or less, if you will. The building material uh, and it's, is also different. It's Indiana limestone from Bedford, Indiana, because it, it was a material that lent itself well to the Beaux Arts style, which is and the Beaux Arts style is really a form of uh, neoclassicism reaching back to Greek and Roman roots. So, so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, again, very a more sophisticated form, perhaps the Second Empire, more sublime in some ways. Uh, but when the board hired Trumbauer uh, in 198, they told him, though, don't just think of this one section, think of the whole block, if you will. And that's what he did. So he planned for a clubhouse that would be uniform on all four sides of the block itself. So while the 15th Street section was still under construction, the board hired Trumbauer then to build a new middle section, right? So he, in beginning in January of 1911, they demolished those three 19th century editions, the brick and brownstones, and then uh, Trumbauer designed and built the middle section, as we know it, that opened up towards the end of 1911. So in two years' time, two-thirds of the league clubhouse is now the, the Trumbauer, uh, Beaux-Arts, Indiana Limestone clubhouse itself. And of course, the third and final phase was to take the Broad Street building and basically encapsulate it in the Beaux-Arts uh, Trumbauer building. When that plan was sent to the membership for its approval, let's just say there was another civil war in Philadelphia. All right, the answer was, uh, no, you will not touch a brick of that building. I mean, the members were really upset about that and they let the board know what they thought and what they felt and the board got the message and they left Fraser's 1865 clubhouse alone. So that's, this is the way the building looks to this very day, all right? Now, obviously, this is a very dated photograph. Uh, Photoshop from 1913, such as there was a building on the south side, was the old manufacturer's club, which is still there. And look at those cars on Broad Street and how they parked in the middle. An old Philadelphia tradition to park in the middle of Broad Street, right? So now the building behind the lig, the Broad Street building, is the land title building, which was designed by Trumbauer and opened in 1902. And Trumbauer's office was in there. That's where he went to work with Julian Abel. So, so let's see what's up next.
uh, postcard, color postcard. Again, we talked how it works. They would take a photograph, colorize it, and sell them. So another view of the, in the completed clubhouse itself, 1912. Here we go. Looking at the West End, all right, you can see how still plain and simple that building is, but you can see the rustication on the, on the, on the, on the ground floor and the first floor, the, the big coins in the corners. Uh, just a stunning building in terms of its simplicity. And again, with that white Indiana limestone when the sun hits it, it's just absolutely gorgeous. So the 15th Street section on the right-hand side of the photograph, the middle section on the left-hand side. Let me go back. And of course, if you look at that middle section, those three tall windows that you see, that's Lincoln Hall to give you some sense of geography, if you will, right? Okay, so let's go back. All right, there we go. And here we have the 15th Street entrance to the clubhouse. Uh, that is called a frontispiece. And you can see how the club's motto, Amor Patri Ducat, is in a prominent place over the doorway. But just look at that whole frontispiece full of all those neoclassical architectural elements. They're just a wonderful entrance uh, to the building itself. So. So here we are. So we are at the end of the Lake Clubhouse. We're at the end of this little episode. I hope you enjoyed this rather, uh, you know, quick, but hopefully somewhat comprehensive uh, journey th down the block to look at the, the league's three clubhouses. And in future episodes, we'll maybe look at each of the different buildings themselves with the different architects and go a little more deep in the weeds. So, so I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope this whets your appetite for more architecture. Uh, which is one of my favorite subjects, so I'm happy to do it. Uh, I, so thank you for joining us on behalf of the Union League Legacy Foundation. I wish you a, a good week, and we'll see you next Monday, I hope. In the meantime, everybody take care and stay well. Bye now.